Thank you. <laughs> All right, I gotta say, I've spoken at a lot of conferences, and this has got to be the most interesting conference I have ever even been to as a participant or whatever. So I, I'm gonna write all this down so I don't forget it, because this is pretty incredible. Um, so we're gonna talk about marketing your wool and sheep products in the 21st century, and we can go ahead and, and just go to the first, get going on that first slide. So I'll just let you know that just in case you're not sure, you're like, oh, I don't know, do I really want to be in here? Um, you're in the right room. If you want to learn about the power of relationship marketing, if you want to know what a website can do for you, if you want to know why the money is in the list and how to get started with that, and that means email list. And this is something that all marketers are talking about now. Why you need a Facebook page, what other social media and search engine options you can use, why you do not need to do all the things, because there are so many that you could be doing. Um, why you should not hire someone to do this for you, and how you can do what you need to do in less than an hour a week. So I am a really busy person. I don't have time to be spending hours and hours on this. And so I pretty much for everything, like all my homesteading stuff that I, that people know me for is all about paring it down to the absolute minimum essentials so that you can do this in a reasonable manner. Next slide, please. So just really quickly who I am. We've been raising rare breeds since 2002, and I launched the antiquityoaks.com website in 2003. So it was a long time ago. It was a pretty ugly website. They all were back then. And then um, I got on Facebook in 2006. That is back in the day when it was still only available to college students. Yes, I am that young. I'm just kidding. Um, no, I was in grad school getting my master's in communications in 2006. And so I was lucky that I was able to get on it before your average person. So I've been able to play with it a lot. And then I started thriftyhomesetter.com in 2011 um, to coincide with the release of my first book. I had actually been blogging um, on a different blog for my farm, like an online farm diary, since 2006. And then in 2011, I started thriftyhomesetter.com as my author's website. My, I've had books published in 2011 and 2017, and then Raising Goats Naturally was published in 2013 and the second edition in 2018. I've been teaching online for UMass since 2013. I have a new book coming out next year called Goats Giving Birth. And oops, I have the typo there. Goats Giving Birth is what's coming out in 2020. Um, and then I launched Thrifty Homesteader Academy in 2016, which is an online, it's online classes. And that's where one of the things that, um, if you want to talk to me about that later, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. I don't have time for it in this one, but that's where like if you feel like you could teach people something about what you do, like something that you've become an expert in, sometimes accidentally. I did not say I want to be a goat expert when I grow up. Um, but something maybe even accidentally, you want to be able to teach people that you can do that online. Next. So the first thing I want to do is um, a relationship marketing is really at the heart of everything that you're going to do. And um, a lot of people say that they can't, you know, they don't know how to sell their products because they can't afford to advertise. And the good news is you don't have to. Um, this is not about advertising. You cannot compete with McDonald's and Walmart and Coca-Cola. And you don't even want to try because they've got millions to spend on advertising. There is no way you can possibly compete with them on advertising. On the flip side, there is no way they can possibly compete with you when it comes to relationship marketing. There's just no way. Like they, they're, they're a big faceless corporation that has no heart, no soul, you know. And so Forbes magazine has had this definition out there. If you search for relationship marketing online, this, is, this has been what has come up for as long as I've been teaching marketing, and it's, which has been like at least 10 years, more, longer. Um, and it basically says, Relationship marketing is a strategy designed to foster customer loyalty, interaction, and long-term engagement. It is designed to develop strong connections with customers by providing them with information directly suited to their needs 
and interests and by promoting open communication. That's the slowest you'll ever hear me talk. And it's because I feel like every single word of that is so very important. It's all about their needs, their wants, because when, you know, think of yourself as a consumer, whenever you see another product or something, you're always thinking, what's in it for me? Why should I buy this? And so are all of the people who are gonna buy things from you. Relationship marketing happens at the farmer's market, at the farm stand, at the fiber show, through email, on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, all those places. And Joel Salatin is even talking about this in his 1996 book on pastured poultry. And he's got several pages in there about it and how awesome it is about how even there in a, in a mostly pre-digital world, some of us were on Prodigy back then, <laughs> but most people were not. It was, and he even talks about then how he had customers coming to his aid when, you know, when one customer complained about a product that other people would say, no, that wasn't his fault. Um, so people buy things from people that they know, love, and trust. And this is a really common thing that you'll see in a lot of marketing material. And a lot of times love, it says like, which I'm like, well, yeah, if you just wanna be average, people can like you. People will buy from you once, maybe twice if they like you, but I want them to love me. I want them to be stark raving advocates. Um, I want them to go to the level of super fan. There's a new book that just came out. Um, I'm reading it now called Super Fans, and it's all about how to get people to really, really love you. And it's kind of funny, I saw this recently because he talks about people you know, standing up for you. Somebody recently complained on the Thrifty Homesteader Facebook page, why are you always talking about goats on this page? And like, I did not even have to respond. Like, other followers of that page responded, you know, and said really sweet things, like, because Deborah's an expert on goats and, you know, stuff like that. And like, and um, because goats are a thrifty way of getting dairy for your family. And the one, the answer I personally loved the most was, um, it's about goats, exclamation mark. Get over it. <laughs> I was like, oh, I wish I could have said that, but I can't, but it's okay, one of my other fans did. So like, that's why you want people to love you. Um, and so that is your mission, is not to go out and spend a bunch of money on advertising or anything. Your mission is to get your customers and potential customers to know, love, and trust you. And here's why, and so the first way that you can do that, because you can do that, remember I said farmer's market, craft shows, all that kind of stuff. So there is all that stuff that definitely cannot be discounted. Like face to face with people is really awesome. And this is actually a condensed version of a two hour presentation that I've been giving at the Mother Earth News Fair um, lately. And so it's condensed a little. So I talk a lot more about like the farmer's market and the crafts fairs and the fiber uh, festivals and stuff like that in the other, um, when I'm doing the whole two hour thing. Um, but a website is absolutely essential today and here's why. Um, first of all, you own it. Um, social media is basically rented land. Um, you don't wanna build your house on rented land and you own your website. So you can put anything you want on your website. The next one is that it shows everyone the full picture of who you are. If somebody just goes to your Facebook page, they'll see the last few posts, but that may not give them a really good idea of who you are. They're gonna have to spend a lot you know, more time scrolling and stuff to get a bigger picture. And then it's where you put answers to questions that people ask over and over and over again. On thriftyhomesteader.com, there are 450 articles. 120 of them are about goats. And most of them, I mean, I tell you, I honestly feel like I have written it all. There is nothing left. But I still get emails every single day from people asking me questions. And that's where the new posts come from because people will ask, well, what do I do about this or that? And so I'm like, oh, okay. And especially like if I find myself answering an email for the second or third time, I know I'm gonna take a huge chunk of that email, 
cut and paste it into um, WordPress where I can turn it into a full-fledged article so that the next time somebody emails me that question, I can say, great question, I wrote about that, here's the link. And it takes me a minute or two to respond to that email rather than half an hour because I'm writing everything from scratch. Um, and you cannot replace a website with social media. Because for one thing, if, you, if you're only on social media, you can't do what I just said. Every time somebody asks you a question, you have to write the whole big long answer again. And so it's just way more time consuming. So if you've got the website, you've got that information there, and you can go ahead and just keep sharing it. Um, so this is a website pages checklist. These are some, so again, the question is, what can I have on my website? These are the things you can have on your website. First of all, you need to have an about page that tells your story. That's what we were talking about earlier. You know, Zephyrin was talking about his story. And um, this is where you say, and my story is, we were clueless city slickers in 2002 when we moved to the country to start growing our own food organically. And I can just go on, like I got the whole thing memorized because I've said it like, you know, a few hundred times by now. And so that's what you put on your about page. When somebody is brand new, they've never met you before, or maybe they just met you briefly at a fiber festival and now they went home and they want to check out your website. So they can go to that page and get more information about you. And then you can have informational pages about all the breeds you raise. So that means like at a minimum, you're going to have, you know, like a page that talks about your sheep, a page that talks about your pigs, a page that talks about your chickens, your garden, that kind of stuff. Now, if you really get into breeding for conservation stuff and you have um, animals that are registered and everything, our goat website, we actually have a page for every goat because we've got their milk records, a picture of them, all of their statistical information if they've got um, performance scores or anything like that's on there. And we also put at least a paragraph or so just what about what that what we love about that goat, you know, and why she's a part of our herd. And that is really important for people who want to buy breeding stock, you know. Um, like this goat usually has quads. Some people don't like that. Some people love it. And so you need to let people know that. Um, and then it's really a great idea to have a blog as part of your website now. And blog um, is short for what used to be called, back in the dark ages, weblog. Um, and then it just got shortened to blog. And it basically is just an, on like it started out as an online diary. Now it's just a super simple way to update people on things. So you, it can be a journal or diary, but it also can re include progress reports on planting, birthing, sharing, when you have new products available. You know, like if you just finished one of your products and you're all excited about it, you can talk about, you know, this great new pillow that you've created with uh, greener wool and stuff that's not going to be so bad for the environment. Um, you can also include your response to things that you read online or current events. One of the things I wrote about was when um, a couple years ago, people were starting to hit the whole backyard chicken thing really hard and talk about why backyard chickens were terrible and nobody should have them and it's just this crazy hipster thing and everybody's an awful owner. And I responded, I basically wrote an entire blog post in response to, I think it was a New York Times article that someone had shared with me that was super negative. And, you know, I actually wound up writing two posts. One was, here's what's wrong with this post. And then the next one was, how to be a responsible backyard chicken owner. Because I wanted to make sure that all of that bad stuff in that first article didn't actually happen. Um, you can have guest posts from customers employees and interns. We've had interns on our farm over the years and once I get to know somebody, like they, some of them are there for a couple months and we've had like pre-vet students and um, people who want to be farmers. We've had people who work at a zoo that want to know more about things and a lot of times towards the end I would ask them if they would be willing to write a blog post about their experience and usually they've said yes. Um, hardly anybody has said no, which I feel like gives, it gives the rest of the world 
a third person opinion. It's like, yeah, of course we're talking about how great we are. But you know, what about this person who came here a couple months ago and has been living with us and working with us and getting to know our animals and seeing what we do firsthand? You know, how does she feel about all of it? Um, you can have Q&As with other breeders or customers. Now that would be like, you might want to ask somebody if they would do a guest post for you. And if they say, oh no, I wouldn't know what to write. Say, would you do a Q&A? Like, I'll just send you a list of questions and then you just respond to them and then we'll just post that. And that works really well also. Um, you can have a page for upcoming events. Um, like if we, we used to do a farm crawl, which basically was they would come visit our farm as long as well as four other farms. And we had a passport that they could get stamped at each farm. And at the end, they would get, um, a, somebody would get a prize. We would draw from the passport, the completed passports, and somebody would get a prize. And that worked really well to get several hundred people visiting our farms in a single weekend. Um, you can do reviews of products. And I, I don't mean products you're producing. I mean products that you use. And um, so basically to help people decide what to use. Like if you're selling fiber, you could review a spinning wheel or a hand spindle and talk about what you love about it or not. Now if you do that, you do need to disclose if they gave you the product for free or if you bought it so that people know that there's full disclosure there. Links to other pages or content that you recommend. That is, links to other pages is incredibly important because that is one of the things that helps Google establish your authority. And authority is like a legit Google word. <laughs> um, like everybody has an authority score. Like the Livestock Conservancy's authority score is really high. Uh, I forget what it is. Like, so do you know what it is? It's way up there. The, so linking to the Livestock Conservancy is really, really smart because that's good because Google's like, oh, they're sharing information from a source we know is credible. So for example, on all of your, like on your breed pages, you, you know, if you have a page about your breed, link to the Livestock Conservancy page for more information because that's gonna make you look better. And don't worry, people worry about competition. They're like, I don't wanna give people, I don't wanna help my competition. You're not really helping your competition that much. You're helping Google understand who you are better. You're helping their algorithm work better. Patterns or recipes for your product. So if you're selling food and you can explain to people, you know, we used to sell a ton of heritage turkeys and people would ask, do you have to cook them any differently? And so I wrote up a whole thing about like how to cook a heritage turkey. I have goat recipes on my website because people, a lot of people have no idea. They've never eaten goat. They have no idea what to do with it. And I have lamb recipes because again, a lot of Americans have not eaten lamb either. And then you can also include videos of the farm and animals. In fact, one of the recent algorithm changes on Google they're changing all the time, guys. It's crazy. This is why I go to conferences all the time. One of the changes to Google is that they are ranking pages higher if they have a video on them. So um, you can either, so you can embed a video from Facebook or YouTube. So you can um, make a video, you put it on Facebook, do a Facebook Live, you can make a video and put it on YouTube, and then you embed that video in your blog post. And I'm actually in the process of like, adding videos to everything. Um, and in fact, one of my mentors recently said something about Facebook Lives and all of a sudden I was like, because I was working on like all these really complicated videos and it's taking me forever. And she said something about Facebook Lives and I'm like, oh my gosh, I can just do a Facebook Live and embed that in a blog post. So, you know, all of a sudden, like right now, my number one blog post is diarrhea in goats. I'm so proud. <laughs> and so I'm like, I'm just going to talk about diarrhea in goats for like 10 minutes on Facebook, and I'm going to embed that puppy right there and keep that up there so that it continues to be on the first page of website results when people are searching for diarrhea in goats. Does anybody know where the best place is to hide a dead body? The third page of Google, because <laughs> nobody looks there. It's like it's insane the number of people that don't even go past page one. So you want to do everything you can to be on page one. And then you need to have an email list because 
You own it. Um, this is the thing. So there are people who all of a sudden, and especially like people in the alternative health space, um, if any of you follow Dr. Axe or some of the other alternative health providers, last year, a year ago, Google algorithms hit them so hard, they went from millions of page views a day to a few hundred thousand. Um, because Google is like, mm, we only want to give out stuff that, you know, like the American Medical Association and the Heart Association and all those people say is good. So, so their traffic just plummeted. But you know what? They all have an email list. So they're still sending emails to all the people who've subscribed to that. Um, Facebook can be kind of persnickety. They've got these algorithms that control things. Like you're, you are working with a dumb computer here. It was programmed by a really smart person. But it's not infallible. And so once in a while, you hear about somebody who woke up one morning and their Facebook page was gone. Um, and so if that happens to you, you still have your email list. And that, your, your email list is really, if you're selling things to people, that's really the best place to get your customers. So like if you've got, if you're gonna, I'm gonna be taking lambs to the locker soon and so that's where most of my lambs are gonna go or people on my email list. I'm gonna send them an email and say, lambs are going to the locker for the fall, who wants one? Send me an email and they respond. Um, the best way to develop, it's the best way to develop a relationship with your customers because you can talk to them regularly. If you can do it, okay, so there are people out there telling you to do this every single day um, and I know why they're doing it, because it pays, but these are also people who have like hundreds of thousands of people on their email list. Um, once a week is usually fine, and, but at a minimum you need to do it once a month. Because if you let it go more than a month, people are going to forget who you are. They're going to get your email and go, who is this again? I don't think I remember, you know. Um, or it's just easier for them to just, you know, if they miss an email every now and then, if they miss an email and you're sending it out once a week, that's not as bad as if they miss an email and you're only sending it out once a month. So the more, if you can do it somewhere between a week and a month, that's good. Um, and also, it is inexpensive. So most farmers will never need to go beyond MailChimp. MailChimp is free up to 2,000 people. And I, I use MailChimp for my farm um, because I only have about 250 people on that list. I use ConvertKit for my author list because I have 5,500 people on there. And so um, it would not be free on MailChimp anymore. And ConvertKit is just way more powerful. And so I really love it. And then people are going to say, are people really going to give you their email? The conversion rate is really low, you know, in terms of people visiting your website. It's usually, um, and this is the cool thing, you get these stats when you, have, when you pay for these things. Um, the conversion rate is usually going to be somewhere between 1% and 5%, depending on what kind of ethical bribe you are giving them. You do need to usually give them some sort of an ethical bribe. So like with my um, author site, like right now I'm giving people a guide to winter on the homestead. So if people subscribe, they can get that. But I also have other stuff out there all the time. Like people can subscribe, like they, they can get my free email course on parasites. Um, they can sign up for a lot of different things and that puts them into my email list. And then, and then the next thing is, won't people hate me if I put an email collector on my website? Um, if it's a really, if it's a big obnoxious pop-up, they, you might make some people unhappy. But the bottom line is, they probably weren't going to buy anything from you anyway if something like that turns them away. A lot of people do sign up, you know, so the more people you have, the more are going to sign up. The other thing is, as a farmer, if you're doing a lot of face-to-face, people are much more likely to sign up face-to-face. -face. So when I do a talk um, at the Mother Earth News Fairs, for example, if there are like 60 people in an audience listening to goats, I give them a text number that they can, they can text their email address to and they will get a copy of um, the PowerPoint that I am presenting and um, probably two-thirds of them sign up. So that's a really good ratio. Of, that's a really good conversion rate. If you're face, when you're face to face with people, like when we would have the farm crawl and you know, we'd have like about 300 people going through there, somewhere between 50 and 100 would sign up. 
for the email list. And that was just as simple as create, you know, sign up here to get our email newsletter and have it sitting on the table there in the tent where we were selling the fiber and everything and people would walk up and write their name and email address there and so we could send them our email. So here's what you have on social media. Um, Facebook gets 2.41 billion with a B, monthly active users. Um, that's worldwide, of course, um, but that is huge. And so that's why I wanna focus my time on Facebook, and I'll give you some more Facebook stats in a second. But this is how it compares to other ones. Um, Messenger in Facebook is actually considered a completely separate thing, and I'm not gonna talk about that, because you do have to do a, use a paid service to do e-blasts through Messenger. And the rules for that are insane, and they're getting worse come January 1st. I see nodding. <laughs> the rule, like two years ago, I went to a conference on this, totally on this, and everybody was like, oh, yeah, 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 we're doing it, we're doing it. And now everybody's like, uh uh. Like, it's just crazy. Um, so YouTube gets 1.9 billion monthly active users, which is huge. Um, Instagram, a billion every month. Twitter, 355 million. Pinterest, 250 million. And then Ravelry, I can't even get monthly users on Ravelry. Like, it's super primitive. Um, it was invented about 10 years ago and it hasn't been updated. So if you've been online for 10 years and you go to Ravelry, you'll be like, feel like you just went back in time in a time machine somewhere because you're gonna, it's gonna look so different than what you're used to today. Now, so the reason that I picked Facebook, other than the fact that it's number one up here, because there's, um, there's a lot of misinformation about Facebook. So first of all, because you're like, well, I don't know, a lot of people are leaving Facebook. The statistics are not showing that. The statistics are showing that it's actually pretty flat, going up a little bit. It's actually overall users for Facebook. I updated this from three months ago. There are 100 million more people on Facebook now than there were three months ago. So overall, it's trending up a little bit. Not like it was before. You know, like before it was going up like this, and now it's like going up a little slower for the last three years. But seven out of 10 adults in the United States use Facebook. In the US, YouTube does have a larger percentage of, viewer, of users. 73% of US people use YouTube. Now, I don't recommend it because it takes a lot of work to do a YouTube video. Um, how many of you know Justin Rhodes? He has half a million subscribers on YouTube. That man puts out a video every single day. Um, it's him and his wife. I think his wife does most of the editing. I visited them because they did the Great American Farm Tour and they came by our farm. And, um, but it is unbelievable the amount of work they put into it. And that's what you have to do to get half a million people following you on, on YouTube. Um, Instagram is a very distant second with 37%. So like when you hear people going, oh, everybody's leaving Facebook and going to Instagram, uh-uh. <laughs> There's half as many people on Instagram as Facebook. So where do you want to be? I want to be where there's twice as many people. Um, and Pinterest is only at 28%. And as I was doing this slide again, I'm like, why am I even going to give you any more information about Pinterest towards the end? Um, because Pinterest is just getting crazy, and you'll see why in a little bit later. 70, so here's another thing too. 74% of people who are on Facebook are on it every day, okay? So you're in, you can be in front of them every day. Um, and Facebook is used by all demographic groups. This is another thing where people are like, oh, aren't young people leaving Facebook? Only the teenagers. And how much money do teenagers have? How many of you have customers who are teenagers? So they don't really, teenagers are not our demographic. So the fact, they're, they're spending lots of time on WhatsApp and Snapchat and those things, which honestly, nobody is monetized yet. They're like, hmm, not, sure, not quite sure how we can make money yet on those apps. 
But Facebook, we, we know how we can use Facebook to make money. 79%, um, and this is Pew. All of these statistics come from the Pew Research Foundation. I picked that one because everybody, I think everybody's heard of Pew. Everybody's like, yeah, that's a credible source. There are marketing companies where this is their whole job, and they do research too, and some of them are putting the... 70, the 18 to 29 year olds, some of them are putting them into the 80%, like 80 to 85% of them are on there. 79% um, of 30 to 49 year olds are on Facebook. And then it starts to go down a little bit. So six, only 68% of 50 to 64 year olds, and then way down once you get over 65. So you're only at 46%. But overall, this is a really good place to be. But that's not what that liked by this page box is about. That pay that box is really about helping Facebook understand who you are. And before I, when I was brand new as an author, and started the Thrifty Homesteader Facebook page, I made a really big mistake in that I like like every time I I spoke at a library or places like that, I would like them with my Facebook page because I thought that was just polite, you know. Um, and in reality, that just confused Facebook for a while because they're like, oh, you're like a library. <laughs> and it's like, no, I'm not at all like a library. And so you want to make sure that you like pages that are very similar to you. Um, so if you have a page that has less than 500 fans, once a day is fine. You don't want to post more than that because you're going to dilute it. So here's another thing that I found is that some people, you could tell, like they went out to their pasture today with their phone and they're snapping pictures and posting them because like they got to post at 8 o'clock and 8.30 and 8.45 and 9.30 and all of those posts just totally diluted each other. So you would get tons more reach if you posted one this morning at 8, one tomorrow at 8, one the next day at 8, one the day after that at 8, to spread them out over the course of several days instead of all at once. So that, because um, a single post is going to get a certain amount of traction with Facebook. And when you put something else up too soon, it's going to cannibalize. They're going to cannibalize each other in most cases, unless you've got something super viral. Once in a blue moon, it doesn't go bad. But 99% of the times, not a good idea. Um, once you get up, and then like somewhere between 500 and 1,000 fans, you can probably switch to twice a day. And you know it's time to switch when you're getting a lot of engagement. You know, like if 10% of people, it's like if you've got 500 um, people following your page and you're getting five comments and likes and shares and people tagging friends, if you're getting five of those things, then you could go ahead and start posting a second time and do it about six hours after the first one. Most pages are gonna, um, the people who follow most pages are gonna wind up um, peaking in their use of Facebook at about five o'clock in the afternoon Eastern time. So I don't post anything after five o'clock Eastern time typically um, because I know that usage is like going down at that point. And after 9 p.m., it just falls off the face of the earth until tomorrow morning at around 6 a.m. And then once you get more than 5,000 fans, you really need to be posting two or three times every day to get the best. And the thing about this is, this is also about helping Facebook understand who you are because they're gonna show your posts to people who like you first. If the people who like you are um, sharing it, commenting on it, reacting to it, tagging a friend on it, any of that stuff, then the more, the higher that percentage gets, once you get past about eight to 10% engagement, they're gonna start showing it to other people who look like those people. And then some of those people, and this is really cool, you can invite, if somebody reacts to one of your posts, you can invite them to like your page. And a lot of them do. Not all of them, but a lot of them. That's better than nothing. So that's another fun thing you can do. <coughs> and then you want to do different types of posts. You don't just want to do status updates or just do photos 
or just videos or just links. This is like killing me. Because like I can want you can you can spy on other people. And so I spy on other bloggers and authors like me. And there is one person who has three times as many followers as I do, and she gets 10% of the Facebook action that I get. And the reason is because everything she posts all week long are links. Facebook doesn't like that. Once a week she posts a question. Everything else she posts, and she posts twice a day, they're all links. <coughs> Facebook doesn't want you to take people away from Facebook. So unless you've already got a lot of good positive juice built up with Facebook, you don't want to do anything that's going to drive people away from Facebook. I am on, I'm actually one of the few people who still gets a lot of engagement from links. Uh, at most conferences, you hear people going, oh, links are dead. Don't even bother with links. And that's because Facebook doesn't really like them. But I am getting away with it. And I think it's because engagement, like people are still engaging with them. I still get some of my highest engagement from my links. And it's because they're all about helping people. They're about things like diarrhea and goats, you know, that people have questions about or problems with. Um, okay, next. So Instagram is owned by Facebook. It's a photo platform. <coughs> I do not put any energy into Instagram because you cannot click on Instagram in the links unless you have more than 10,000 followers. So that pretty much rules us all out. I'm not going to work that hard to get 10,000 followers on Instagram. So what people have to do is they, it's not a clickable link. You can, of course, you can copy and paste a link into a post, but people are going to have to copy and paste it into their browser to be able to go to that page. It's not a clickable link. And so people don't want to go to that much trouble. I mean, yes, they are that lazy. So it's just really not good. Uh, it's not a good use of your time. And direct messaging is where the magic happens. So I've gone to conferences, I've talked to people who are doing well with Instagram, and it's all about the direct messaging, and I don't have time for that because it's all about, because if you're posting stuff that somebody loves, they're going to send you a direct message, and then you have to respond to them, and then you've got to have a conversation with them with a lot of back and forth. It's just one person. I really prefer it when somebody asks me a question on Facebook because then I am building up positive Facebook juice because that's interaction, that's engagement, that's making things happen. Facebook's gonna make more people look at my post if somebody asks a question on it and I respond to it. So that's why you don't wanna say, you know, look at these beautiful apples, come buy them at the farmer's market on Saturday at 10 a.m. You wanna say, wow, look at the beautiful apples growing in our orchard. And then if somebody really wants to buy your apples, they're gonna ask a comment. Are you going to have those at the farmer's market this Saturday? Or do you ever sell your apples? I love it when people say, do you ever sell? I'm like, yeah, that's the whole point. <laughs> um, and, and, but that's engagement. So the fact that they asked a question, the fact that you responded to the question, all of that's positive stuff that's going to make Facebook show that to more people because they're like, oh, this is engaging. People like this. Um, and so best practices for Instagram is to post once a day. Hashtags are still a big thing on Instagram, um, and then you have to engage in the direct messaging to make it actually work for you. Pinterest, I'm going to go through this really fast. You guys may be the last people to see this. I may just completely cut this slide from this presentation. There are 250 million people on Pinterest. If you are a blogger, Pinterest is a place to be. I am still on Pinterest. In fact, I've hired somebody to do my Pinterest because um, it's gotten so out of hand. It's more of a search engine than social media. There isn't person-to-person -person interaction on there. If you use Pinterest, you know. You're, I mean, like I recently was like, I need to make new raised beds that are not going to rot after eight years. So I was looking for raised bed ideas on Pinterest. That's how people are using it. And so they do click on links to go to websites. Um, so there's um, other people are advertising for you. So that's cool. You know, they're posting links to your website. Um, and it has group boards where you can share to get a little bit outside your personal circle. And then um, if you're using a scheduler called Tailwind, they have tribes, which is basically a quid pro quo thing you join. Um, and for every, in most of them, it's like for every pin you ask them to share, you have to share a pin from somebody else. 
And this is, this is why I have hired somebody to do Pinterest, because to compete on Pinterest, you need to have 20 to 50 pins every single day. And so you need, you're supposed to have like up to 10 pins per post, and then you have to buy this extra software to hide all those pins, because who wants to go look at a blog post that's got 10 pins on it? And so I would rather poke out my eyes with a pencil than sit there and create 10 pins. If you're a graphic artist, maybe you're, you know, you're like, yay, I'll make pins all day long. Um, and in fact, I mean, that's the thing. The person I hired to do it loves Pinterest. That's all she does. She's a Pinterest manager. And she thinks it's the most fun thing in the world to make 10 pins for every post that I make. And I'm like, more power to you. This is great. I am so happy to pay you. And the only reason I am doing it is because, like I said, you can snoop on your competition, not just on Facebook, but all online. And I know a lot of my competition is getting three or four times as much traffic to their websites from Pinterest as I am. So I know I need, if I want to get those people, I know I need to be on Pinterest. But otherwise, it's not a good reason to be on Pinterest. So you're wondering, what on earth can you possibly post if you need to post every single day? So here are ideas for photos. If you want to take a picture of the screen, go ahead. Um, but it's really, it's all the stuff that you think is so boring that, because you see it every single day, so it's not a big deal to you. But this is stuff that, to city slickers, they think this is awesome and incredible. And you know what? When people come to your farm, what do they do? They whip out their phone and they start taking pictures of everything. And so, you know, you can do a close-up of the head, uh, so of grazing animals, pictures of two or three animals in a pasture near each other, picture of animals grazing in the distance with the sun rising or setting. Try to avoid pictures of animals' back ends. Honestly, some people will call you on it. My husband took pictures, she's nodding. I'm like, I was out of town one time. My sweet husband, he does his best. You know, we had a bunch of lambs born when I was out of town and he's taking pictures of all of them and it was all their back ends because they're nursing and stuff. And people are like, no lamb butts. We want to see their faces. So get their faces because that's what's cute, right? Um, and then baby animals, other than just getting a picture of their back end, you really cannot lose with a baby animal. People love baby animal pictures. So a picture when they're still wet and trying to stand, like right after being born, if they're nursing, definitely get some of them looking directly into the camera. Um, two or more sleeping together, just make sure there's some good contrast. Like if you have two black animals sleeping together in a dark corner of your barn, you're not gonna see anything. And then another cool thing is you can do a series called Watch Us Grow. And believe, would you believe I got this from a flower farmer? She took pictures of her chrysanthemums. Like week one, pot with dirt. No kidding. These are the chrysanthemums. Week two, little bitty thing. Week three, week four. And she said when she was at the farmer's market, people were coming up to her going, wow, I love your pictures of the plants growing. She's like, okay. <laughs> and when I heard her say that, wow, people get that excited about chrysanthemums, I gotta start doing more baby pictures of like real babies. And then animal care, stuff that you think is just normal, like the sheep shearing is a great one. Do not take pictures of like a bad situation. So there was somebody, like take a picture of a professional, like Emily doing it right, where you've got the zen sheep, <laughs> where they look all happy and mellow and stuff. Um, somebody posted a picture of a sheep on the Shave Them to Save Them page like six months ago during shearing season, and it was, um, it was in a shearing stand and it had a chain across its nose, and it was a rusty chain on top of that. I think that just made it worse. People were flipping out. Because they're like, one woman said, I would never go to my hairdresser again if she tied me down like that. So, you know, make sure that, like, think about this through the eyes of somebody who has no clue what they're looking at. And are they going to think it's okay? So one of the mistakes I made was, um, and my husband knew it was a bad idea, we're going out to castrate baby goats. And I said, oh, I want to do a Facebook Live of this. 
He's like, do you think that's a good idea? And I'm like, oh yeah, people who follow me, they keep asking me you know, about castration questions. So yeah, let's just do a video of this so people can see how it's done. Oh, people loved it. My followers loved it so much. There were all these, thank you so much. This is so helpful. This is so great. They were tagging their friends. It went wild. And Facebook is like, oh, this is a very popular video. Let's show it to everyone who loves goat videos. So then all of a sudden, I was suddenly getting like, like that close to death threats. People telling me to use the Berdizo on my husband and myself. And like, it was horrible. So think about this before you put some of the stuff out there, okay? It's happy, happy days on the farm. We don't have unpleasant things happening. So um, people feeding and watering animals and then product creation. So like if you are doing wool, um, it's great to like show a picture of you skirting wool. Here I am skirting wool from, you know, the Sears Cliff or um, carting. Like we did a video of the carting machine at the mill where we take it so that people could see how a giant carting machine works or a spinning wheel. Um, if you're spinning or however it's being spun, we're running low on time. And then here are more questions. So like questions that you can post on Facebook as status. So these are things to ask your people. What do you like to drink when spinning? Another question, knitting, another question, when crocheting, and on and on. Um, talk to Toya there, she does a sip and spin, um, where she recommends a wine for spinning certain wool. <laughs> and <laughs> there's another lady who does YouTube videos where she has like a cocktail for all the different wools that she spins. Um, what's your favorite wool for making Scarves, rugs, socks, fill in the blank. Um, that's like four or five different posts right there. So if you want more ideas, you can take pictures of that. Unfortunately, I'm running out of time. So, um, And then other options on Facebook, you can do polls of people. People love that. Again, like I said, if you're asking their opinion, they think it's just awesome um, when you ask them. So like, what's your favorite, knitting or spinning? What do you prefer, raw fleece or roving? And if you're familiar with groups, you know in groups you can put, I think there's almost an endless number of options. On a page, you can only put two options. So you have to have two things for people to choose between. Um, and you can use words or GIFs for the answers in that. You can do videos of all kinds of stuff like trimming hooves, sharing, skirting, carding, not castrating. Um, and then, you can do, um, you can take photos in Facebook. Like if you've got five or six photos, like yesterday I did, um, I took a bunch of pictures of the dye workshop. I'm gonna upload those to the um, Livestock Conservancy page as a video. You can, if you have a bunch of photos, you can upload all those photos and then Facebook even has music. So that basically it's a video with music that people can watch. So they can just, it's a slideshow with music. Um, one of the ways, and so here, this is really important, to get through this quickly is that you need a scheduler. There is a free scheduler in Facebook, which is extremely, it's easy to use. Use the scheduler, because here's the deal. You go outside, you take a bunch of photos, you come back in the house, you sit down with your photos, you sit down with that list of questions, you go on your Facebook page, you go into the scheduler, and you just start, like if you're new, you've got a couple hundred followers on your Facebook page. One day you post a photo and you tell them the really cool story behind that photo in a couple of sentences. The next day you post a question, like what do you like to drink when you're spinning? The next day you post another photo. The day after that you post another question. The day after that, come up with a poll, you know? Which, which wool do you like better? White wool or colored wool? And let people choose and put it in poll fashion. So that just kind of makes Facebook like you a little more because you're like, oh, you're using our toys. Um, and then these other four are some other ones that you can use if you um, are getting into different social media. So like if you want to so post on multiple social medias at the same time. I use SmarterQ because that's what recycles my posts. So that's how I've got my 170 questions in there that it just keeps recycling them. And if something tanks, I give it a second chance. If it tanks again, I delete it. I'm like, eh. I mean, one day, maybe it didn't work, but twice, no, we're not gonna do it again. 
Um, and then batch your content. So that's basically what I was describing there is to batch your content so that you sit down between the time it takes you and if you're just getting started and you're doing a post a day, that's seven posts a week. If you So go outside, spend 15 minutes taking pictures or just take pictures while you're doing chores and then come inside and do those posts. That's only probably going to take you 15 or 20 minutes. Maybe the first time it'll take you half an hour because you're finding stuff, but the next week it'll take you 15 or 20 minutes. And then, you know, as you need to, you, as your page grows and you need to do more posts, um, it should not take you more than an hour a week tops. Next. Um, and then the big question people ask me a lot of times is should I hire somebody? Please don't. If you don't know how it works, please do not hire somebody. I have heard so many horror stories. It just makes me angry. It makes me sad. People can, I have heard of people paying $500 a month for social media management that is completely worthless and it is going to get them nothing and then they're going to say, I spent $500 to get somebody to manage my Facebook page and it didn't do anything for me. Yeah, that's because they were only posting like a couple times a week. That, like they're not, like I don't know if they don't know what's best practices or if they are just happy ripping people off, you know, because like I can make $500 a month, you know, in 15 minutes because that's pretty much what they're doing. So, and that's really, really sad. So unless you know how to do it, and don't ask your neighbor's friends to do it, or your neighbor's child to do it, or your teenager, whatever. They are an expert in communicating with their friends online. They don't know anything about the business end, and the business end is a completely different story. Um, and then Ravelry, I, I have to mention it because it's so funny, I go to these social media conferences and stuff, nobody's heard of Ravelry, unless they happen to be a knitter or a spinner or something. Because like I said, it's Technically, it's very outdated. It's very old looking. Um, but this is where fiber artists hang out online. There are um, 8 million that have signed up for it because they don't, they don't publish the kind of metrics everybody else does. We don't know how many of them are active on there. We have not, over 900 who are active on the Shave Them to Save Them group on Ravelry. And some of the people will tell you in there very specifically that they're not on Facebook, that they're only on Ravelry. And um, it is completely free, but if you want to post photos, it's $5 a year. So it's a very, very low investment. And if you're selling fiber, obviously you need to post photos, so you're going to have to pay that five bucks. But it seems to be working really well for people, especially those who are in the Shave Them to Save Them group. And you can join, there's tons of other groups that you could probably join to sell your fiber. And, and then that is it. So if you want to find me, I am online all over the place at Thrifty Homesteader, um, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest. And then um, if you go to my Antiquity Oaks Facebook page, you will see what not to do. I actually, like a month ago, I put a week's worth of posts up every single day so that I can use it. I have an online um, Goats 365 and part of that is I'm teaching people business, the business aspect of it. And so I went on there a month ago and like did a bunch of posts so people can see the metrics like, yeah, you're down here. And now whoosh, this is what happens when you post every day. This is where your reach goes and you quit posting and it goes back down here. So at this point, because all of our Antiquity Oak stuff pretty much gets sold through a grocery store now, so I don't have to direct market anymore. Um, but I got that page up to over 2,000 followers before I pretty much just ignored it. And now I use it for teaching purposes. But I, if you go to Thrifty Home Center on Facebook, that's where I'm doing all the best practices. That's where I'm doing, because that's where most of, that's where my income comes from, is from, is from educating people. And, and through the Facebook page, I am you know, getting people to know, love, and trust me, so that then they'll be more likely to buy my books and do my online courses and things like that. So do we have time for any questions? Yes. Um, how much time do you have left? to actually do the shoot or like things? No, like I said, it's 15 minutes. No, you go outside, take your phone with you. Um, oh, it's not in my pocket right now. Take your phone with you. Most people have their phone with them when they're doing chores. You see something cute, take a picture. No, I asked about how much time you have left. Oh, me personally. Yes. Oh, okay, I, my husband does most of the animal stuff now. 
because for two reasons. One is I injured my knee very badly four years ago. It is swollen 24 seven um, because of the injury. So, and the more I walk on it, the worse it gets. So I actually have a fitness watch to keep my number of steps down. <laughs> Like I see, once I go over about 6,000, the swelling just gets worse and worse. So, um, so I'm out there mostly when he says he doesn't know what to do, <laughs> unfortunately. I have a question early on in your talk. You mentioned uh, having interns uh, work at your place, but it's not directly related to your theme here. But I was just curious, how do you handle insurance issues or payment? Um, we're an LLC, so if you're going to have members of the public on your farm, I suggest becoming an LLC to protect yourself so that you don't lose everything. Um, educate yourself about it first. I read three books about it and then got a farm attorney to help us draft that. Um, the other thing is I had them sign a waiver so that it says, and it's a pretty scary sounding waiver. You know, it's like, I know that working on my farm is inherently dangerous and I could trip on a chicken, do this, this, this. I could be severely injured or die and I will not hold you responsible and yada, yada, yada. And maybe you, some people would say that's not going to help, but it can't hurt. So um, it's, and it's, for, it's like it didn't cost me anything to type it up. I, sent, I emailed it to my lawyer and he goes, looks good to me. So, um, and then what was, did you have, an, and then that was the, oh, if you want to do interns, the first thing I thought of is Joel Salatin wrote a book called Field of Farmers. And that book is excellent. There's also a video, I've interviewed him about interns on my Facebook page. So if you go to the Thrifty Home Center Facebook page, there's an interview there with him. So you can see what he talked about. But his book, Field of Farmers, is excellent. Like if you seriously want to get interns, I'd suggest that. Okay, she says time. All right, time.